friends and welcome welcome to the renaissance english history podcast a part of the agora podcast network i'm your host heather tesco and i'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because i believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are our place in the universe and being much more deeply in touch with our own humanity so my friends this is episode i think 221 i've really lost track Um, But we are talking about Sir Philip Sidney because you know what? I did an episode a couple of weeks ago on Frances Burke and I said in that episode, she was his wife, and I said in that episode that I had done an episode on Philip Sidney because I thought I had. And it turns out I did a full episode with Tudor Time on Mary Sidney Herbert. And then I had also done an episode called Three Tudor Poets, like years and I don't know, it was like 10 years ago. Um, but when I looked back, because I was going to put it in the show notes, the link to the episode on Sir Philip Sidney, it turns out I actually hadn't done that episode like I thought I had. So I lied. So now I am um, now I'm doing that episode that I said I had done. So the lie becomes a truth or something. Anyway. That is the reason. That is the backstory. Here we are. Just a quick thank you to those of you who join the YouTube channel or become patrons on Patreon. Patrons and members get extra episodes. They get discounts to TutorCon and at my shop. Uh, They get all kinds of fun things. This month, depending on the level that they're at, uh, there's going to be an entire course on the Wars of the Roses. Some of them get free tutor planners in December. So you know what? It's just, it's a heck of a value. Plus you just get that amazing feeling of knowing you're supporting an independent podcaster. I mean, like that just just like makes you feel good, right? You can like walk around feeling slightly smug because you're the patron of a podcaster. So if you would like to have that uh, slightly smug feeling, (laughs) you can go to patreon.com slash Englandcast. Or if you are listening to this on YouTube, just click join this channel to sign up. Also, my friends, my show turns 15 years old this year, 15 flipping years old, like, and which is amazing because I've actually gotten younger. So I'm not really sure how that works, but clearly I've like figured out a way to warp the space time continuum. So I'm having a couple of special events this year. And one thing I want to ask you about is if you would like to come to a birthday party, Uh, the fabulous Brigitte Webster, who has a Tudor period home just outside of Norwich has offered to play host to a party. We're looking at the 26th of May, which is a beautiful time of year. I cannot wait to go be in her space. So if you would like to come to that, we really only have space for about 10 people. But if you would like to be one of those 10 people, let me know. I want to basically make sure that we have enough people uh, to justify Brigitte opening her home. Um, I don't want to do it if it's going to be like just me and her, however much fun that would be. (laughs) And that would be a lot of fun, Uh, but I don't want her to have to go to all the trouble of getting things ready and everything if we're not going to have enough people. So um, if you would like to come to a birthday party on the 26th of May outside of Norwich, please do let me know and we can figure that out. All right. That is that. Let us get into Philip Sidney in the lush landscapes of Penhurst Place in Kent. Sir Philip Sidney began his remarkable journey, destined to become a shining emblem of the Elizabethan age. Born into the lap of aristocracy on November 30th, 1554, Sidney was the eldest son of Sir Henry Sidney and Lady Mary Dudley. His lineage was illustrious. His mother was the eldest daughter of John Dudley, first Duke of Northumberland, and sister to Robert Dudley, first Earl of Leicester, a favorite uh, in quotes, of Queen Elizabeth I. Sidney's education was at Shrewsbury School, where the seeds of his future intellectual prowess were sown. From these fertile beginnings, he moved to Christchurch, Oxford. It was at Oxford where the contours of his literary and intellectual landscape were shaped, laying the foundations for his future endeavors in poetry and statecraft. His family played a pivotal role in nurturing his talents and ambitions. His father, Sir Henry Sidney, was a well-respected statesman, serving three times as the Lord Deputy of Ireland. This political backdrop provided young Sidney with the early exposure to the nuances of governance and public service. 
His mother, Lady Mary, imbued in him the grace and sophistication of courtly life. Sidney's siblings, too, were influential in his formative years. His sister, Mary, was a writer, translator, and literary patron in her own right. She later became the Countess of Pembroke and played a crucial role in Sidney's life, both as a confidant and intellectual companion. Sidney's dedication of his longest work, The Arcadia, to her is a testament to their deep bond. His brother, Robert Sidney, later Earl of Leicester, also emerged as a significant figure in the arts and politics, further entrenching the family's legacy in the cultural fabric of England. At the tender age of 18, Sidney embarked on a journey that would mark the beginning of his political and diplomatic involvement. In 1572, he traveled to France as part of the embassy negotiating a marriage between Elizabeth I and the Duke d'Alençon. The experience was the first of many that broadened his horizons and deepened his understanding of international politics. Sidney's sojourns across Europe were both extensive and enlightening. He traversed through Germany, Italy, Poland, Hungary, and Austria. These travels were more than mere grand tours. They were a rite of passage that exposed him to a diverse array of cultures, intellectual discourses, and political landscapes. During these travels, Sidney met and engaged with numerous prominent European intellectuals and politicians, absorbing their ideas and perspectives. This exposure undoubtedly played a crucial role in shaping his worldview and his later work. He returned to England in 1575 and found himself at a crossroads of personal and political endeavors. It was during this time that he met Penelope Devereux, who would later inspire his famous sonnet sequence, Astrophil and Stella. However, the intricacies of court politics and his own familial connections also kept him deeply entrenched in affairs of state. His early political involvement was characterized by a blend of idealism and pragmatism. Sidney frequently found himself navigating the complex and often turbulent waters of Elizabethan politics. His opposition to the French marriage of Elizabeth to Alençon championed by Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, led to a significant quarrel. This incident culminating in a foiled duel and a lengthy letter of admonition to the Queen showcased both his moral conviction and his boldness, traits that would define much of his life. We actually talked about this in a YouTube video I did a couple of weeks ago on Tudor Christmas gifts and the art of giving gifts to the monarch and after this incident, uh, Philip Sidney for Christmas the next year gave Elizabeth a jeweled whip to show that he was at her mercy, that he was her subject, and it apparently worked and he was restored to favor. So now let's talk a little bit about his connection with Penelope Devereux. Penelope, who would later become Lady Rich, was a figure of captivating beauty and intellect inspiring one of the most renowned sonnet sequences of the Elizabethan era, Astrophil and Stella. This sequence, composed in the 1580s, is more than a collection of verses. It is a window into Sidney's soul, revealing his deep, possibly unrequited love for Penelope. The narrative of Astrophil and Stella mirrors the complexities of their relationships. Though Penelope was much younger, it is believed that she was the muse behind Sidney's lyrical explorations of love, desire, and emotional turmoil. The sequence showcased Sidney's ability to weave intricate emotions with delicate linguistic craftsmanship. The sonnets are a testament to Sidney's mastery over the sonnet form, placing him alongside Shakespeare in the pantheon of great Elizabethan sonneteers. Sidney's artistic endeavors were further nurtured by his interactions with the prominent figures of the Elizabethan literary world. Among them was Edmund Spencer, author of The Fairy Queen, who dedicated The Shepherd's Calendar to Sidney. Sidney's influence extended to his participation in the Areopagus, a group formed with the intent of reforming and elevating English poetry and drama. This group, possibly more a concept than a formal gathering, represented the intellectual ferment of the time, with Sidney at its heart advocating for a fusion of classical poetic forms with English verse. Sir Philip Sidney's literary canon is marked by its diversity and depth, but two works in particular stand out for their enduring impact, the sonnet sequence Astrophel and Stella that we talked about and the critical treatise The Defense of Poesy. 
Asterful and Stella is a sequence of 108 sonnets, a cornerstone of Elizabethan poetry. These sonnets weave a narrative of unrequited love, like we said, thought to reflect Sidney's own experiences with Penelope Devereux. This melding of Italian form with English language and sensibility marked a significant evolution in the sonnet tradition. The sonnets oscillate between adoration and despair, capturing the complex emotional landscape of love. Love. Sidney's use of poetic devices such as metaphor and paradox heighten the sense of longing and unattainability that defines Petrarch in love. In contrast to the passionate lyricism of Astrophil and Stella, the defense of poesy, also known as an apology for poetry, stands as a seminal work in literary criticism. Written in response to contemporary critiques of poetry, this treatise argues for the moral and educational value of poetry. Sidney defends poetry as a noble art that can inspire virtue and teach moral truths, countering the puritanical view of poetry as frivolous or even morally suspect. He posits that the poet, through the imaginative faculty, creates an ideal world that can guide readers towards ethical conduct. The defense of poesy is not just a rebuttal to critics, it's a profound exploration of the role of the artist in society and laid the groundwork for Renaissance literary theory. In The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia, commonly known as the Arcadia, it's another of Sidney's monumental contributions to English literature. The pastoral romance is a blend of adventure, love, and philosophical musing set in an idyllic pastoral landscape. Its narrative is intricate and multi-layered, weaving together various subplots and characters. The Arcadia is characterized by its idealized portrayal of shepherds and noble characters, a reflection of the Renaissance fascination with pastoral settings as a realm of simplicity and virtue. The Arcadia had a significant impact on the development of English prose fiction, its blending of poetry and prose, along with its exploration of philosophical themes within a fictional framework, was innovative for its time. The work inspired a generation of writers and continues to be studied for its artistic merits and its contribution to the evolution of the novel. Sidney's creation of a complex, interwoven narrative structure in the Arcadia paved the way for the more intricate plot developments in later English literature. So even though he is often linked with Penelope Devereux, in September 1583, he married Frances Walsingham, the daughter of Sir Francis Walsingham, Queen Elizabeth's spymaster. This union not only allied him with one of the most influential families in England, but also with a woman of intellectual and cultural depth. Their marriage was seen as a blend of political alliances and personal affection, resulted in the birth of their daughter Elizabeth in 1585, who later would marry Roger Manners, the fifth Earl of Rutland. Sidney's experience at the French court also left a very profound impact on him. During his stay, he witnessed the horrors of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, an event that saw the massacre of thousands of French Huguenots. He actually took refuge in Francis Walsingham's home in France. Walsingham was there as well as an ambassador to France, and many of the English Protestants actually found refuge and safety in Francis Walsingham's home that day, Sir Philip Sidney being one of them. This experience deeply affected Sidney, further solidifying his staunch Protestant beliefs and shaping his views on religious tolerance and the politics of his time. So his life met a tragic and heroic end on the battlefield. In 1586, during the Battle of Zutphen, a conflict that was part of the Anglo-Spanish War, Sidney was mortally wounded. Engaged in combat against the Spanish for the Protestant cause, his injury came not just from the brutality of war, but also from a poignant act of selflessness that has become legendary and possibly apocryphal. As the story goes, while lying wounded, Sidney, parched and in pain, passed a bottle of water to another wounded soldier with the words, Thy necessity is yet greater than mine. This moment, more than any other, cemented his reputation as the embodiment of chivalry and self-sacrifice. His death was not immediate. He suffered for 26 days before succumbing to gangrene. His passing was mourned not just as a personal loss to his family and friends, but as a national tragedy. The funeral procession held in February 1587 was one of the most elaborate and grand ever staged for a non-royal person in England. 
His body was interred in Old St. Paul's Cathedral in London, a site that was later destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666. Sir Philip Sidney left behind a legacy far greater than his 31 years of life would suggest. He became an icon of Elizabethan England, a symbol of the virtues and ideals of his era. His gallantry, literary genius, and unwavering commitment to his principles elevated him to a status that few could match. So there we have it, Sir Philip Sidney. We will leave it there for now. I would love to hear your thoughts on Sir Philip Sidney and on his poetry. If you have read it, uh, I would love to know any thoughts you have. Just leave a comment wherever you are listening to this. And of course, a reminder about the birthday party on the 26th of May and becoming a patron or member of the YouTube channel, patreon.com slash Englandcast to become a patron. Or if you are listening to this on YouTube, you can just click join this channel and you will be able to join right away. All right, my friends, thank you so very much for your listenership. Over the last 15 years, gosh, we've been through a lot together, haven't we? Thank you so much for being there with me. To those of you who have found me more recently, thank you for coming on board. Uh, We're so glad to have you here. All right. I will be back again very soon, my friends. Take care of yourselves, be well, and I will speak with you soon. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, a sandal may be sweating.